Hello, programmers. I've had some people ask, how do I reject negative numbers and also process invalid inputs? For example, in the Paycheck program, when it asks for hours worked and pay rate, if somebody types in F-O-U-R-T-Y instead of typing in a number, how can the program process this and go back and ask for the user to input a number instead of letters? Well, in this presentation, I'll show how to do that. Part of this is called defensive programming. Defensive programming is a form of defensive design intended to ensure the continued function of a piece of software under unforeseen circumstances. Defensive programming practices are often used where high availability, safety, or security is needed. Well, this is a definition that came right out of Wikipedia. Here are some of the things to think about. We have some hardware such as a keyboard. When somebody types something in the keyboard, the first thing that happens is for each keystroke, when you press a key down or the key is released and it goes back up, an interrupt is sent to the operating system. The operating system starts collecting characters and stores them into its own buffer which is basically an array. It will sit there and then if we have a program, which is an application program, that asks for user input, these inputs are collected into its own input buffer and we call this the scanner. Then the program can either collect an entire line of text, it can ask the scanner, I want an integer or I want a floating point double value. The scanner goes and pulls out individual characters out of the buffer and either sends an entire line or if you ask for a number pulls out digits and starts collecting them and building a numeric value if somebody puts in five four and you've asked for an integer it will collect the five and the four and make it into an integer 54. if you ask for a double and somebody types in the characters five four point seven six then the scanner will collect those individual characters and convert them into a double for you. If you ask for an integer and somebody types in 54.76, then what happens is the scanner will pick up the 5 and the 4 and when it sees a point, this is not an integer value, then it will give you the 54 and leave in the characters 0.76. Here's another example. If I want to input hours and pay rate, and the first thing I do is have a prompt that says enter hours. If I put in four zero space two zero, the scanner will pick up the four zero space and see the space which is not an integer type character, and then pass over the four zero. But the space two zero is still sitting in the input buffer. When we get ready and output a prompt to say enter pay rate, well, there's still some stuff left over in the input buffer and it immediately picks up the 2-0 and sends it without even letting us type anything else in. There's something else I want to think about and that has to do with validating a range. For example, we want to reject negative numbers. Or I want to validate that the hours worked is between 0 and 168. Well, if you multiply 24 times 7, there's only 168 hours in a week. So therefore, the hours worked for a weekly paycheck has to be between 0 and 168. In a math expression, we might have 0 less than or equal to hours less than or equal to 168. Well, this is a good for a math expression, but it doesn't work with programming. If I want to validate the range, in software, if I write something like if, open parentheses, zero, less than or equal to hours, less than or equal to 168, close parentheses, that really looks like the math expression, but it is no good for programming. I actually need to write some valid logical expressions. One of the things I could do, I could say zero, less than or equal to hours, and, that's the double ampersand, this is the logical and, Hours is less than or equal to 168. Well, that's okay, but it actually might look better if I said if hours is greater than or equal to zero and hours is less than or equal to 168. That actually kind of looks a little bit better. What we have are two comparison operators and a logical expression. Hours greater than zero is one comparison expression and hours less than or equal to 168 is another comparison expression. Combining those together with an 
logical AND. Since the greater than or equal to and less than or equal to have higher priority than the AND operator, we don't need to put parentheses around hours greater than or equal to zero, hours less than or equal to 168. You can put the parentheses there if you wish. You don't need to because we know the precedence of greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. These comparison operators have higher priority than the AND operator. Here's another thing to look at. If the program is expecting an integer for hours worked and somebody types in F-O-U-R-T-Y, well, the program gets confused. And as soon as the scanner sees the F for F-O-U-R-T-Y, it stops looking and just sends back a zero. Here is a check that we can do in C++. If I say int hours, C out. Enter hours worked. CN greater greater hours. If CN dot fail, CN sets a flag and we can check that flag. It's a failure flag. I can say if CN dot fail, open close parentheses and put the whole thing inside the parentheses for the if statement. So if CN dot fail, that flag is set if we're not able to convert the FOURTY into an integer. So then we can look at that and I can say, oh, see out, error processing input for hours. Well, you may have to do a little bit more code in there to decide what to do next and we'll see if we can cover that in a little bit. Another option to cn.fail I could use if not cn and that works just as well. If I look at the C version instead of C++, C we're using scanf, although if I'm using Microsoft, then I have to use scanf underscore s. What scanf does is it returns a numeric value to indicate how many things scanf was successfully and converting. Right here, we are expecting to convert one value. So I can say int conversion count equals scanf, open parentheses, quote percent d quote because I'm expecting an integer if I was expecting a floating point value I'd be percent f scanf open parentheses quote percent d quote comma that is our format specifier and then ampersand hours so I'm passing the address of the hours variable to the scanf routine if my conversion count is not equal to a one something went wrong I'll print out an error message or do some other type of processing. There's some other possible problems which I'm not really covering at the moment, but if I'm expecting to input like a name, I have to make sure that there's enough room in my buffer in my application program. Because if somebody types in a long name and I'm only expecting like seven characters for the name, then the buffer could overflow and I could overwrite some other part of my program. For this demonstration, I am using a simple program that inputs two integers, computes, and then displays their sum. As the discussion progresses, I am going to keep adding more and more code to show how to make sure that the numbers entered fall within a selected range to be valid. Then I'll show how to detect and reject data type mismatches, such as entering letters when the program is expecting numbers. I'll show how to eliminate duplicated code by placing it in a subroutine function and finally use a loop to keep requesting data until a valid entry is made. You will be able to use this subroutine in your future projects. I recommend against copying any of the code from this discussion until the final version is shown. The final version of the code for the program is available on the class website. In C and C++, subroutines are called functions. If a subroutine is part of a class definition in object-oriented programming, it is usually called a method. Here is the simplest form for the C++ program. The variables are being declared, C out statements prompt for the numbers, and C in statements read the numbers from the keyboard. The sum is computed and then displayed. When I write the program in C, the prompts are done with printf statements and the inputs are done using scanf or scanf underscore s with Microsoft. Check this out. 
The preprocessor pound define statement can be used with the pound if and pound else preprocessor statements to either enable or disable code before it is even compiled. I'm using pound define CPP true if I want to compile the C version or false if I want to compile the C version, which is in the pound else block of code. Sometimes I use pound define to enable or disable code used for debugging a program when I first write the program. Let's try out the program. I'll enter the numbers 12 and 7. 12 and 7. The sum is 19 is displayed and the program exit with a return code of 0. The return code is only meaningful if this program is started by another program that will check the return code when the program finishes. When I run the program again with the values 3 and 7, the sum is 10, even though the first value of 3 was not in range. When I enter the letters TEN for the first number, The program displays the prompt for the second number, but didn't give me the opportunity to enter anything. It just jumped directly to the output and displayed the sum of 0 and 0 is 0. The zeros were because num1 and num2 were initialized to zeros when the variables were declared and the program never put anything else in them. When I ran the C version of the program, I got the same results. Now let's add the range checking. Instead of checking for a valid input, I will check for an invalid input. The code has if num1 is less than 5 or num2 is greater than 25, and here's a block of code, see out, value is out of range, return 1. I'm using 1 as the error code. If num1 is out of range, an error message is displayed, and the program exit with an error code of 1. Similar code is provided to validate the range for the second number. Looking closely at the code, the only thing different is the values that are checked by the if statement. Now we can see what happens when a 3 is input for the first number. Now let's put in the code to see if the input failed because CN or scanf was expecting one type of data and a different type of data was entered. For example, if the letters TEN are entered when the program is expecting to read an integer. Already discussed is using an if statement to test CN.fail or not CN for the C++ code, or testing the return code from scanf in the C program. The first thing we need to decide is where to put the code. It needs to be after the CN or scanf statements because this is what we'll be reading the keyboard. It should be before the if statement that is testing the range because there's no point in testing the range of the input value if the input was not read correctly. Therefore, I'm putting the CN or scanf test directly after the CN or scanf statements and changing the if statement for the range to check to an else if. Here's the code for the C++ program. If not CN. See how a numeric value is expected. Return 1. The same code is duplicated when reading the second number. Let's test it out. First, I'll enter the letters TEN for the first number. Cool, program displayed. A numeric value is expected. It even works correctly when the first number is valid and the letters are entered for the second number. In the C version of the program, I need to declare another integer variable that receives the return code from scanf to get the count of the number of inputs correctly processed. I need to make sure that I only declare the variable one time. 
Here is the code for the C program. Except for the declaration of conversion count, the same code is duplicated when reading the second number. The conversion count variable only needs to be defined once. There is a lot of duplicated code. It gets even worse if more inputs are needed to be processed. I want to take as much of the duplicated code that processes console inputs out of the main program as I can and put it into a function. Starting with the CN or scanf calls, there is an if statement and its block of code that checks for an input data type mismatch. Next is the else if statement and its block of code that validates the range. I'm even going to place the prompt in the function. At this point, the prompt could either be in the function or left in main. We will need it inside the function later in the discussion, so I may as well put it in now. I want a function that will prompt for an input, read from the keyboard, check for a data type mismatch, and validate that the number was within a range. If either of those two checks fails, display an error message and exit the program. If both checks pass, return the input value back to the main program. The main program can use an assignment statement to save the input value in its local variable. Looking closer at the function, I see that it starts off with int. This defines the data type that is returned back to the main program. Then there's the function name. When you create a function, you can give it any legal name you want. For this exercise, I chose to name the function get input and validate. I tried to give it a name that describes what it does. After the function's name is an open parenthesis, a list of parameters, and a closing parenthesis. In C or C++, a name followed by parentheses identifies that the parentheses are part of a function declaration or a function call as opposed to being part of a math expression. The function defines three parameters, including their data types. The parameters are used to collect information from the main program when the function is called. You can choose the data types and names for the parameters. I chose to call them prompt, min value, and max value. Now I'm giving my function the ability to handle any integer values from the main program when validating the range of input values. The body of the function starts with an open curly brace and ends with a closing curly brace. Here is the body of the function. Although the main program used variables named num1 and num2, these will still be variables for the main program. We can use something more generic here. I'm declaring an integer variable input value and initializing it to a zero. Then CN tries to read an integer from the keyboard into the variable input value. Just like before, we can test the error flag from CN to see if it was successful. If CN fails, display an error message and exit the program. You may notice that this time there's an exit one inside the function instead of return one in the main program. The return statement at the bottom of the function is being used to return the value read back to the main program, and we can only use the return statement to do one thing. Using better programming practices, we should be able to find a way to return an error flag back to the main program and let main terminate the program. More on that later in a different discussion. Since we are receiving the minimum and maximum values for the range of valid inputs from the main program, we can test them against input value variable, which was read by CN or scanf. If both tests pass, we can use the return statement to return input value back to the main program. The C program version of the function is very similar, but it uses scanf and printf instead of CN and Cout. Let's look at how this function can be used in the main program. Num1 equal get input and validate, open parentheses, quote, enter number from 5 to 25, close quote, comma, 5, comma, 25, close parentheses, semicolon. The first parameter is the prompt message that is to be displayed. Num1 is going to receive the value that was input from the keyboard, assuming that both validation tests were OK. The 5 and the 25 are the minimum and maximum values for the range of the valid numbers. These values are the two parameters that are passed to the function which receives them as arguments, named 
min value and max value. See if you can remember the definition of parameter and argument. Parameters are the values that are passed to a function. Arguments are the function's own named variables that receive the parameters from main. A similar line of code is used to get num2 by calling the get input and validate function. Let's try it out. Oh no! I got a compiler error. The C and C++ compilers are single pass compilers which mean that everything must be defined before being used. I placed the function definition and its code below main, but I tried to use it from inside main. There are two solutions to this. Either place the function before main or provide a function prototype. You may as well get used to using function prototypes in larger projects. The function itself may even be in a different file. The pound include files contain tons of function prototypes. The C++ pound include IO stream contains prototypes for C out and CN and CERR ENDL and many others. The C pound include stdio.h contains prototypes for scanf, printf and many others. I am placing a prototype for the get input and validate function at the top of the program right after the pound include statements. The prototype can be exactly the same as the function declaration, but it ends with a semicolon and does not have a body of the function. So I'm just going to do a copy and paste of the function declaration and use the semicolon. Let's see if that fixes the problem. Since I'm placing the code for both C and C++ versions of the program in the same C++ file, the const keyword is needed in the function definition. If you are planning on eliminating all the C++ code and place the program in a file with a .c extension, you need to remove the const keyword, which does not exist in the C language. Super cool! It worked! This program is still not very friendly. Anytime the user enters a bad value, the program displays an error message and kills the program. We can add just a few more lines to make the program much friendlier. When a bad value is entered, we can use a loop in the get input and validate function to display the error message and then ask for the input again instead of killing the program. I'm using a do while loop to make the program keep asking for an input until a valid input is provided. The do while loop starts with the keyword do and uses an open curly brace and a closed curly brace to identify the block of code that is to be repeated. There's a while statement at the end of the do while loop that has a conditional expression that causes the loop to repeat if the condition is true. I'm declaring a boolean variable and have named it keep trying. I tried to give it a name that is meaningful. Boolean variables only have two values, true and false. I'm starting the loop off by setting the keep trying flag to false. I'm going to assume that there is no error until one is detected. Instead of killing the program with the exit one statements, they are being replaced with keep trying equal true. Now, if there is a type mismatch because the letters were entered instead of numbers, or if the input value is out of range and error message is displayed, the keep trying flag is set to true and the while loop control statement is going to cause the loop to repeat and ask for the input again. It is important to set the keep trying flag to false at the beginning of the loop so that if the loop repeats the code again, we will start off with the assumption that the input will be good. Coding the loop was not very hard, but you need to think of what really goes inside the loop and most importantly, what is going to cause the code to repeat and when the loop is going to end. The C language did not define a Boolean data type, so we can just use an integer. You can use the pound define statements to declare settings for true and false, or you can just use a zero and a one. In C and C++, the actual definitions for true and false are a zero integer represents false and a non-zero integer represents true. Any time we make a change to the program, we need to test it out again. First, I will try inputting a number that is out of range. Yeah, out of range. 
out of range, out of range, in range, good, and good. Fantastic! It works great. Now let's try typing letters such as 10 instead of a number. Arg! My program is stuck in an infinite loop. I can't send this out. I need to fix it. I will persevere. I will make that program do what I want it to do. First thing, determine what is causing the problem. Let's go back to an earlier part of the discussion. We can see that when trying to read an integer from the console, the non-integer characters are left in the input buffer by the scanner. If the program tries to input an integer and the letters TEN are in the input buffer, an error message is displayed, the prompt is displayed again, and the scanner tries to read from the input buffer. It still contains the letters TEN, so the program loops again and again and again. The solution is to clear out the input buffer when bad data is received. I remember doing this in the past, but I couldn't remember the exact code, so I did an internet search to find it again. Place these two lines of code in the C++ version of the program after the error message. These lines clear CN's error flag and flush up to 10,000 remaining characters that are in the input buffer. Place these two lines of code in the C version of the program after the error message. These lines read up to a thousand characters from the standard input keyboard buffer. Since buff is not used anywhere, those characters are just discarded. Let's try out the program again. Here are some text characters. Very good. Try it again. It still works. Super fantastic. Now you can just copy this code and put it in any of your programs where you need to input and validate an integer. You can even modify the function to input and validate a double data type. If you want to reject negative numbers, then set the minimum value to zero. I really hope you enjoyed this presentation. It not only covered range validation and checking for mismatched data types when inputting from the keyboard, but we also covered an introduction to functions and do-while loops. See you around. Bye.